Welcome back. It is great to see you guys. Very good to see you. Now, I know some of you were in some very warm places of a break, like Southern California, Texas, Florida, Saudi Arabia, right? Back there. Were you in Israel? Okay, kudos to you. Shalom. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, I was freezing my butt off here in New York City. Yeah. Not bitter or anything. <laughs> uh, we, uh, but I'm really glad to see you guys back. Uh, last year was a great semester. This year is going to be another great semester. We have a some, uh, some uh, couple special groups that I want to acknowledge who are here today. One is the group from Oxford, who just came back. So if you guys stand up for a second. There about six that were in Oxford for the last semester. All right. So if, uh, if you want to know more about Oxford, those are the folks to ask. We have another group there this semester. Catherine was there. Um, we also have another group of students, a uh, special group, an incoming class, spring 2014 class, or be what, class of 2018, but they came in th for this semester. That group, if you would just stand up briefly, about six of them here, here. Awesome. Welcome, glad to have you guys. And welcome to the, the kickoff all-campus gathering for this semester. This is new. An all-campus gathering is new for us. And what we realize is this. We, we are lacking places for us to come together, times and spaces to come together, to meet as a community, to refocus on who we are, what we're about, where we're going. So this gathering is, is about that. We'll have another one later this, later this semester, uh, March 25th. You'll see it on the, the liturgy calendar, but it's on, the, it's on the calendar. So just twice a semester we're doing this. And it's time for us to come together as a collective community and, and refocus and celebrate on what is, what is happening. And I think uh, we are in for a great semester coming up. Uh, last semester, I was just talking with um, these guys who returned this semester. They missed out on last semester. If you were here last year, who was here last year, right? Last year was a rough year for us, dismal in many ways. Uh, it, was, it was hard, it was a hard year. We lost our president, went through a hurricane uh, and other difficulties, housing was scattered, it was a hard year. This past semester was one of the best, one of the highest points I have seen in my 14 years at King's. And I've used the word renaissance to describe it. It's a renewal, a refocusing on who we are a strengthening of the community, and many, part, many things have contributed to that, the leadership of our president, uh, the spiritual life, the renewal of spiritual life on campus, the events the King's Council sponsored, that there were student body-wide. So many things, fall retreat, many things have worked uh, to our good. And I'm convinced this semester we're in now is going to be another terrific semester. And one thing that we want to do, and it's part of our success last semester, uh, we want this semester to kick it off with a day of, of a day of fasting and prayer. We did this last fall, and I think it's part of, part of what happened is God honored that in our community for our campus. So this Thursday, we're doing another day of, of uh, prayer and fasting. Fasting is optional. You guys can do that if you want to. But I do want to invite all of you to take part in that day in some way. There's a prayer gathering in the lobby at 8.30 in the morning. There's one here at noon. Uh, we'll, that'll include some worship and some, some uh, prayer together, and then refuge that night at 7.30 here in this room. But I invite you to, to take part in some way in Thursday's day of prayer and fasting, because I think God, I'm convinced, God honors that and will respond and show his favor upon us. Okay, lastly, house GPA results. Some of you are already mourning. 
Okay, I'm not. I'm going, only going to give you the top three. Okay, the top three. Yes. Trust me. Some of you don't want that. Okay, in third place with an average house GPA of 3.7, 3.17. Let's be clear, 3.17, the House of Thatcher. In second place, with a, an average GPA of 3.27, the House of Truth. And in first place, with an average GPA of 3.3, the house that has shown that they are both scholars and royalty, the house of QE1. Well done. Oh. Now that. Well done. That does, that does change the standings, overall house competition standings. In third place overall in the competition, house competition, is the House of Bonhoeffer. In second place, House of Lewis. And in first place, the House of QE1. Two more events this semester, the House History Competition, and then the Creme de la Creme Interregnum, All right? So things will change, I'm sure, in this semester. Okay, uh, with that, I want to shift. We want to shift to a more uh, serious note and uh, focus our time on scripture uh, and prayer. Pete uh, Fleming, your student body president, is going to read a passage of scripture and then lead us in a prayer of dedication for this semester. And then right after him, President Thornberry will come up and address us. I like how when you shift too serious, you invite me up, so that's good. <laughs> well, uh, I'm excited to have you all back. Uh, I'm excited to be here. I hope you guys had a great break. Uh, while many of you were in the warm, I was skiing in negative 11 degrees. It was brutal, but it was fun. It was so fun. Well, uh, I'm just going to read uh, a passage real quick and um, then just uh, really dedicate this semester to the Lord in, in a prayer and then uh, invite President Thornberry up. Uh, so the passage today is Matthew 6, 1 to 6. It says, Beware of pra practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees you will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who is in secret will reward you. Well, while this is not exactly in secret, uh, please join me in prayer. <laughs> Father God, you are a good God. You are worthy of our praise. You are our King, our Lord, our Father, our friend, our protector. Uh, God, we confess that we do not deserve your grace, um, the, the favor that you pour on us, the love that you pour on us, and that you call us your children. Um, thank you for, for pouring your favor on kings, um, even just over the last six months. Um, thanks for bringing us all uh, back to campus safely now, and we look forward to uh, another great semester. Um, God, may we learn to keep you at the center of everything we do here. Uh, may we praise you and glorify you uh, when things go well, and may we um, have hope and have faith uh, when things are difficult. Um, Lord, may you continue to teach us uh, to be a community in which we, we build each other up, um, that, we, that we 
uh, cultivate excellence not out of a desire to, to stand out in a crowd, but so that we can better glorify you. And may we learn to seek your name together. Um, and, and may we uh, learn as individuals to come before you and pray in secret. Uh, may we learn to win the battles of the day uh, in the quiet of the morning. God, I ask that you keep your hand of favor on this school this spring. Uh, may you strengthen and direct uh, President Thornberry and all the others who, who lead and shape. Um, and God, we, put, we really put this semester in your hands. Uh, and thank you for allowing each of us to be part of, of what you're doing here. In Jesus' name, amen. So please uh, join me in welcoming President Thornberry. Hello. Welcome back. Thank you so much for coming today. Uh, I, you know, George W. Bush used to talk about the soft bigotry of low expectations, and uh, I certainly didn't expect this. So thank you all for coming out. It's fabulous to see you all back. There are a few uh, seats up here for those uh, who are not Baptists. They, they tend to sit in the back, but th those of you that are more, maybe, maybe the more liturgical denominations might prefer to sit uh, closer up here towards the top. It's wonderful to see you all uh, in, in, gathered in this room together. I think this is a splendiferous idea. All kudos to Eric Bennett and to the, especially the House leaders, student body president Fleming. Thank you all for being here. Um, last night I was talking to Stephanie Savim Gardner, who, uh, by the way, incidentally, whose birthday is today. Stephanie, happy birthday to you, wherever you are. Kate Thornberry baked cookies for you, uh, Stephanie. Wherever you are, there's cookies back in the uh, office. If not, it's first come, first serve. Um, but when I, when I, uh, Stephanie said, I'm looking forward to being at the campus-wide meeting uh, tomorrow. And I said, oh, fantastic. And she said, is this the point at which you're going to announce that you've bought us a campus-wide puppy? <laughs> and now I kind of feel bad, because <laughs> I, I didn't get you anything. But, um, um, this actually, what we're doing here is kind of Ivy-ish. It's Ivy League-ish. Back in the day, uh, the college president used to frame the semester uh, in, in the fall with a convocation address and in, in the spring with kind of a life uh, type address. So that's kind of what we um, are aiming to do here. And it falls upon me to, as sort of, as the leader of the college, to ask kind of a funny question. It's sort of a deconstructive question, and here it is. What would it profit uh, the college for it to fulfill its mission and yet lose its own soul? In other words, there are countless institutions uh, across this country that are delivering on the mission of their institution, but maybe they've drifted, maybe they've gotten away from the original vision. This is certainly the case with uh, religious uh, colleges and universities all across the country. And we all know, I mean, we, it's kind of actually, you know, uh, Pascal had sewn into his garments, fire God, not of the philosophers, but of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Jesus Christ. I'm actually contractually obligated to have the mission statement of the King's College, uh, you know, so that's not true. <laughs> but it's, it's always before my mind, you know, people ask me, first of all, they ask me, what do you do? And I say, I'm the president of the most exciting college in America, and it just happens to be in New York City. <laughs> uh, that's true, I believe that, that's true. And then I recite to them the mission. Now the mission, I love the mission of the King's College. We are here based upon the truths of Christianity to prepare students for careers in which we uh, help you to get into a position where you can help to shape and eventually to lead strategic public and private institutions, right? We've all said it, it's right there, and there's a conjunction, junction, what's your function? <laughs> and to enable faculty to speak to critical issues in the public square through their writing and speaking. So faculty, you're involved in this, in, in this too. And uh, so, you know, the kind of the temptation is kind of go high school musical and say we're all in this together and go home. <laughs> um, and actually, you know, we, we're thinking through, one of the wonderful things about the King's Liturgy, it's gotten us to think about spiritual disciplines, which is, I think, very healthy, especially for uh, those of us prone to corruption in New York City. 
and it, it gets us, it reorients our expectations. And as you know, there are kind of two big categories of spiritual disciplines, and we really nail one segment of them with the mission statement. Disciplines of engagement. We, we do really well with disciplines of engagement. It's especially the two disciplines of engagement of study and service, okay? Those are things we excel at the, at the King's College. Uh, study and service are the things that we're, know about, that, that, that we're known about. Um, and it, it's, uh, it's, it's what we're about. It's the kind of thing that makes the press releases. When you get amazing internships, when our alumni destroy small villages, uh, we put that on the website. We, tr you know, we announce that. That's what we, that's what we are about. And that's the, that's uh, honestly the thing that's drawing uh, more and more people here. I, I think just over the break, we had an additional 1,000 applications come in for the King's College for next year. We'll see where it all well, lands. But. Um, <laughs> Kings is about the public nature of Christianity, and it's like the best thing about us. You know, we, uh, we, are, we are healthy because of that. We are not a shrinking violet club, right, because of that. Sometimes, thank you. Okay, it's all right to applaud. I like this. It's kind of like charismatic a little bit, okay? <laughs> Wonderful, all right? Any dog barking? Okay, go ahead. Uh, now would be the time to do that. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, that, well that, that's the campus-wide puppy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Have the campus-wide puppy. Thank you very much. Um, sometimes the disciplines of engagement are forced upon us. We don't seek it. It actually comes to our door. Uh, many of you have been following this. Uh, the mo one of the most fascinating religious liberty stories right before the Christmas break was uh, the, the fact that due to the HHS mandate, the Health and Human Services mandate uh, to provide abortive fashions, uh, one, of the, one of the charities that got involved in this was uh, the Little Sisters of the Poor charity. And the White House was kind of going to war with the Little Sisters of the Poor. And we could actually have, this would kind of be amazing if we wound up having a Supreme Court case called the United States versus the Little Sisters of the Poor. <laughs> I think that would make our point very well. <laughs> it's hard to get more public than that. It's hard to get more public than a Supreme Court case. Um, but there's, there is a discipline, uh, a whole category of disciplines, the disciplines of abstinence, which we'll talk about briefly on Thursday morning, like fasting. And there are a whole range of disciplines of abstinence that we don't really do much with. And one of the chief most ones of that is the discipline of secrecy. Okay, we are not a society that does secrecy very well, okay? Uh, we prefer that all virtuous acts be known as soon as possible. Now, there actually is kind of a genetic history to all of this um, in terms of the, the history of philosophy. Um, in his, this is kind of where you cue the villain soundtrack, in the inquiry concerning human understanding, David Hume, yeah, okay. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, yeah. Um, David Hume really mocks uh, disciplines of abstinence and, uh, and what he calls all manner of monkish ways. Okay? Monkish ways, which would be self denial, humility, solitude, and silence. He says that these are things that produce, uh, and this is a direct quote, solitary and forlorn people. This is his view of people that dedicate their lives in monasteries and so forth. And it's very, uh, his point is this is a very little use to the modern world. This doesn't add up to anything. This doesn't produce anything. There's no material output to this. Um, but, but David Hume didn't, maybe he didn't realize, because he was maybe not an avid Bible reader, I don't know, but these things didn't come from the history of monasticism, they came from the Sermon on the Mount. And in the text that was read today, what Jesus says is that the purest acts of faith are always private, and that there is something original to our service to God that no one should see by God. So what is the discipline of secrecy? The discipline of secrecy is being faithful to God and letting God decide 
when to take that public. And that is why I think Searching for Sugar Man is so satisfying. Okay, now how many of you have seen Searching for Sugar Man? If not, I judge you, okay? A few, a few people. Uh, I don't wanna do too many spoilers here, but uh, you definitely need to watch it. It won the Oscar for Best Documentary. What, where is the TKC Film Club on, on all of this, okay? No, I'm just kidding. I don't wanna criticize anybody. Um, <laughs> Searching for Sugar Man, just to give you kind of this broad thing, is about this obscure, uh, amazing Latino folk rock artist that did these amazing records that supposedly nobody ever heard, except everybody in South Africa, but nobody knew it. And so there's this discovery of Jesus Rodriguez at the last possible moment in his career and why do we love that story? It, it's because it, it was God decided when the right time was for him to become famous. He toiled in obscurity, you know, uh, as kind of a day laborer until that. That's what secrecy and the payoff later, when at, at a time of God's own choosing, is very satisfying. Um, and if you look, now I don't know, I, I realize you have heavy backpacks and maybe you don't have your Bibles, but if you, if you could look at a copy of the scriptures at the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter uh, 6, 1 through 6, um, in Jesus' comments here about having your righteousness be seen before men, one of the things that we must not miss is that Jesus is not saying that giving to the poor or acts of charity or almsgiving, which is what it was called, is a bad thing. As a matter of fact, he assumes that you will give to the poor, okay? It, when you give to the poor, not if, when you give to the poor, uh, you are to do it in this way. And that's in keeping with, uh, that's in keeping with um, uh, the law of Moses, Deuteronomy 11 and Deuteronomy 15. And uh, I don't know if any of you have been reading the book of Tobit in uh, your quiet times recently, but um, here's a quote from the book of Tobit. This would have been framing the, the way people thought about almsgiving. Prayer with fasting is good, but better than both is almsgiving with righteousness. A little righteousness is better than wealth with wrongdoing. It is better to give alms than lay up gold. Those who give alms will enjoy a full life. Now, Almsgiving here coincides with this concept of righteousness. That is what Jesus is talking about. And what he's saying is that righteousness must be experienced in private with God. Now, I think that that is when we kind of look at ourselves in the mirror and look deeply into yourself in the mirror, that is something that we all desperately want to believe. That, that there, is, there is something that is known only by God about the way we are in the world. That somebody is there endorsing us, watching us, whether or not anybody knows. Secret things are awesome, right? We love secret things. We love to find out, that's why gossip is so juicy, is because we want to know secret things. But that's a perversion of the original thing, which is being in private and enjoying life in God in private, okay? Um, now, uh, here's an illustration of this for, for those of you that don't like the Bible. Um, <laughs> if, if you, uh, one of the things I love about Plato's Symposium is that if you know anything about the historical record, it, you know, you have, at, at, you have this soiree in Plato's Symposium. Now, I'm sure we all, you all know it better than I do because you have a PP&E degree from the King's College. But one of the things, whether or not that dinner party actually happened, isn't it awesome to think that those people were all at a dinner party together, right? But the best part of it is that Aristophanes and Plato are at the same table. Now, why is that awesome? Because in the clouds, Aristophanes cruelly caricatures uh, Socrates. I mean, it, it's, it's, in, it's, it's kind of relentless mocking of Socrates. And here we have Socrates 
and Aristophanes at dinner together. Now, what's cool about that? Even though the mockery is referenced in the symposium, they're cool with it. It's like, it's kind of like pro wrestling, you know, where like there's this public battle, but that's Hollywood, but then afterwards, you know, they kind of like go out and have, you know, a steak, you know, and they're like pals behind the scenes. That's awesome because we know that we want secrecy to be true, that, that there are things that are real that are hidden in silence that are only known by God. And, and this is spiritually, I think, though the world longs for this kind of stuff in a world of Edward Snowden's and Julian Assange's and WikiLeaks, where we now live in a society where absolutely everything is known at all times. The thing it, that's different between God knowing us and, for example, the NSA is that it's not creepy. <laughs> it's something that you could actually enjoy. But there's more to it than that. And here's kind of where I want to uh, land, the, land the plane today. Uh, Jesus is criticizing the Pharisees. And we maybe all of us have heard at some point th this, this sort of thing. And, and the kind of the standard, you know, interpretation is that what Jesus is doing is criticizing the Pharisees for doing the right thing for wrong reasons, right? Uh, that's kind of the, the, the standard interpretation. But I think that it's, there's more to it than that. When Jesus uses the term hypocrites, this is a reference to uh, the actors in Greek comedies and tragedies. It's a, it's a term of art that is reserve, reserved for, um, for acting. So, you know, again, the t kind of takeaway is, is don't be uh, a fake, but there's more here. It's about the Greek theater. There's a whole culture in the Mediterranean world coming in the Greco-Roman uh, uh, Greco tradition of the Greek theater. And if you look at a Greek theater, what is in the center of the, the theater? There's a stage, yes. Yes, and in the middle of the stage, there is an altar. And to whom is the altar? Dionysius, right? Dionysus. It's, it's, it's the worship of the Greek god of wine um, and of revelry and of pleasure and the Greek god of let the good times roll. Um, and uh, then after this, when kind of like the, the Halcyon days of Greek theater kind of went by the by, then there were these traveling troops of Dionysian actors, you know, and they had masks. <laughs> right? They were, like, there were, there were people that did this, you know, the, whose masks changed before Michael Jackson. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, you know, they went around doing this. I think that probably is in the back of the mind here. And what Jesus here is saying here, I think, is this. When you do your acts of righteousness, presuming that you will do acts of righteousness, who do you want to be at the party? Who do you want to show up at the party when you do your acts of righteousness? Do you want to be like the Dionysians, whose party is with Dionysus and other actors in public? Or do you want to party in secret with God? Who do you want to party with? Now, the poor will be helped either way you do it. But there's something about you as an individual that's involved in this. So what I'm trying to say to us at the beginning of the semester is this. Um, our engagement with the public square to fulfill the mission of the King's College, I think, if I don't miss my guess, will only be as good as our private parties with God. That's my guess, if I don't miss my guess. Now, how does this play out in the context of the King's College? And uh, one, a thing to keep in mind before we, you know, tear each other apart in fierce academic debate during, uh, during interregnum. Let me, let me park the bus uh, with um, uh, a little Kierkegaardian reference here. I'm doing a directed study on Soren Kierkegaard this uh, semester. I am loving it. I'm back into reading Kierkegaard. 
And in works of love, in which Kierkegaard is now no longer wearing a mask, he used pseudonyms up until this point. He's writing works of love, and now this is, he's, you know, he's out there, Jerry, and he's loving it at this point. He's fully a Christian author. He's not holding anything back. And what he says is kind of a Shakespearean point. He's, he's, he basically says, the entire world, and we could think of our, the King's College as a cosmos of its own, and it is. We have our little cosmos here in the middle of the city. But even the city, the world, is like a stage, right? And people are actors on it. The only difference between a play and real life is that the storyline is more complicated and less under control. It's more like a Kafka novel. Um, that's what real life is, is actually like. And um, so he says, you know, uh, what, what happens is that when we go to the theater, we go to see a film, we suspend disbelief. So Kierkegaard says someone's dressed up as a king and it plays the role of a king and another one as, as, as a beggar. And, you know, you think, how is it possible at this point that we could actually believe Tom Hanks is anything other than Tom Hanks? He's so ubiquitous, and yet we buy it every single time. You know, we're crying, Captain Phillips, we're crying at him. We suspend disbelief. But then the curtain falls, and when the curtain falls, what happens to the king and the beggar? They're just actors. They go back to being actors. Now, Kierkegaard says, here's the thing. What would happen if, when the curtain fell, the people stayed in character? You would think one of two things. Either they had been bewitched or they were insane, right? Kind of a Nora Desmond type that's still in character all of the time, you know, or uh, the, the guy that played the Lone Ranger back before the horrible Disney iteration. He actually, like, kept wearing the mask and the Stetson. I mean, he thought he was the Lone Ranger. These people are mentally unstable. <laughs> This is what Kierkegaard's point is, if you stay in a role. Now, Kierkegaard says, actually, this is practical to all of life because each one of us have a role at the King's College or in life. I am a college president. Pete is uh, the leader of the student body. Drew Johnson is a tormentor of the souls of men. <laughs> uh, everybody has a role. Everybody has a role. We all have different stations and roles in life. But Kierkegaard says in Works of Love, we cannot live that way. We have to realize, yes, we do have, we have to fulfill our station and role in life. That's appropriate when the curtain is up. But when the curtain comes down in community, we are all human, all too human. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. That's all that we are. There's no distinction between people. And in so doing, what we show is that our, our public performances uh, don't get in the way of who we really are, quorum Deo, before God's face, in that secret place with God. And in so doing, when we drop those, all of that pretense, uh, we are reminded of the incarnation, right? Your attitude, Jesus is talking in, about secret righteousness. He's really talking about himself. He's talking about what it means to be Messiah, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality be, to be grasped, but made himself nothing. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, not a mask, he really was a man, and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Wherefore, God has highly exalted him to a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, as we begin the semester, let us kill our public performances. Okay, love the GPA competition. This is my first time for some of this stuff. I love it very much. <laughs> let's, let's pursue the public engagement with all of our strength, provided that the secret things 
are taken care of first. Will you pray with me? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, we thank you for this hour in which to gather and frame this semester in accordance with your word. Father, it is my prayer that if I have said uh, anything that is an error, that you would uh, cause uh, these uh, beloved brothers and sisters of mine to forget it forever, banish it from, do a miracle, Lord, and help them to forget it. But insofar as I have said anything that is true and in conformity with your word, would you help it to sink down into all of our hearts as we go from this place? And as we fellowship together this semester, may it be a foretaste of the time in which we will eat and